In part one of this package, it was established that dangerous goods and marine pollutants can be transported safely by sea, largely due to good seamanship and the guidance given in the IMDG code and related national regulations. The safe transport of dangerous goods by sea is part of a chain of events designed to minimize the potential risks involved. The first link in the chain is the shipper, who correctly identifies, classifies, packs and labels the dangerous goods to be shipped, in accordance with the relevant provisions of the IMDG code. The shipper's written declaration sent with the consignment will contain all the information necessary to establish the correct handling, stowage and segregation of the consignment. The shipping company can then verify the appropriate ways of handling the consignment and stowing it correctly on board ship. On board ship, the emergency information for the commodity must be readily available and its location stated in the Dangerous Goods Manifest, Stowage or Bay Plan. Consulting the emergency schedules in the supplement to the IMDG code, the ship's personnel will identify the recommended emergency procedures and the action to be taken in the event of an incident. For this reason, the ship's personnel will pre-plan the necessary emergency procedures relating to the dangerous or marine polluting cargoes they carry before the ship leaves port. There are some general principles to be applied during any planning exercise. The first one is know the hazards each dangerous cargo represents on board ship. Broadly, these fall into three main groups. Flammable. The flash point of a flammable liquid is the lowest temperature at which its vapour forms an ignitable mixture with air. Flash point figures are given in the IMDG code, and if 61 degrees centigrade or below, they should also be included on the dangerous goods declaration, prepared by the shipper for each consignment. There are a great many substances which are toxic. They may be either solid, liquid or gaseous. Corrosive substances cover a wide range of products, such as hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid and caustic soda. There are other substances which do not in themselves represent any hazard, but may react violently if in contact with certain other substances or water. The second stage of pre-planning is the assessment of the risks the identified hazards represent on board and the required measures to be taken in case of an incident. This is where the information the shipper has provided on the accompanying documentation is relied upon by the shipping company. The special sections in the supplement, emergency procedures for ships carrying dangerous goods, and medical first aid guide for use in accidents involving dangerous goods, will be consulted during pre-planning for answers to questions such as, what is the emergency response to a fire or spillage? What protective clothing is needed? What equipment should be used? Does ventilation need to be controlled? Are any protective measures necessary for the crew not involved in tackling the incident? In addition to the information contained in the IMDG code, there may be national regulations which should also be checked and included in the pre-planning process. For example, the United States Code of Federal Regulations, CFR 49, contains hazmat training requirements which are enforced in US waters. The third principle of pre-planning 
is to ensure that everyone on board is familiar with the emergency equipment and resources available. The condition of the equipment must be checked and its proper function ensured. Everyone must know where it is kept and how it is used. Finally, everyone must know their own duties during an emergency. Drills of the action to be taken in the event of an incident involving dangerous goods should be part of the normal emergency response organization. Perhaps something like this. A fire in a container involving dangerous goods shown here during a training exercise. The particular action to be taken in an incident such as this will depend on the goods involved, the ship's own circumstances and the equipment available. Whilst the emergency response party prepares to fight the fire, the master and the officers involved consult the dangerous goods manifest prepared by the ship and the relevant EMS for specific recommendations. Okay, you contact the fire party, they have to wear protective clothing. Self-containing breathing apparatus. We have to use plenty of water. Rich, chief speaking. Fire Squad 1 is on the way to the force ship to investigate the fire. Some shipping companies lay down procedures to deal with incidents which specifically apply to their own ships. But in every situation, all the backup information about dangerous goods must be available immediately to ship's personnel to avoid any unnecessary delay in taking defensive action. Copies of this information must be kept on the bridge. This is an emergency response exercise on board a row row ship involving the leakage of a hazardous substance. Richard, can you come back and take a look at this? Oh yeah. Right, it's hazardous unit. Evacuate the area, Tony. I'll get in contact yeah. with the mate. Evacuate the area, please. Is everybody clear, Tony? Yeah, everyone's clear. Okay. Chief officer, no, be the deck officer reports the details of the emergency to the chief officer who takes immediate yes, action. We've got an incident on D-deck, a liquid spill from a hazardous cargo unit. Affirmative, Mark, I can confirm the area is clear of personnel. The unit number is India Charlie Tango Uniform. Two four zero two eight one two. Its storage position is D deck, lane three, aft end, storage number one. Uh, Chief Officer Freight Deck, I've received all those details and I'm proceeding to the bridge. The alarm is raised and the crew muster. Your attention please, attention please. Working party blue, working party blue, proceed to stations. For your information, there has been a chemical spillage at the after end of D-deck. Chemical spillage at the after end of D-deck. All personnel, please keep clear of this area. All personnel, please keep clear of the after end of D-deck. The muster list is checked to assemble the emergency party. Uh, 
a bridge to Fred Deck. Richard, can you confirm the UN number? 2227. Please confirm that. Yes, Mark, the UN number. Rapid is reference two, to the two, Dangerous two, Goods two, Manifest identifies the substance um, exactly, it's including its UN number. Reference to column 15 of the dangerous goods list shows the appropriate EMS number and in the supplement the correct action is described. Just looking at the emergency schedule now. Bridge to freight deck. Bridge to freight deck here. Okay Richard, it says wash overboard with copious quantities of water. Can you give me a volume check on that uh, discharge, please? Yeah, the volume is approximately 40 litres. 40 litres. In that case, I think we'll just contain it with an inert uh, material. Um, if you can get the lads in their uh, fire approach suits, please, with the chemical suits on, and we'll, um, we'll use an inert material to contain it as we're in port. I'll cop it. Beecher Samba, Beecher Samba, no bay, no bay. As the ship is in port, the chief officer reports the incident to the shore authorities and requests their assistance. So we have a what we believe is a chemical spill on the after end of our upper deck. Uh, I would be grateful if you call the fire brigade, please. Call the fire brigade for a chemical spill on the no bay on RT1. Over. No bay, this is Beecher, your message received. Uh, stand by. Standing by, sir. I'll revert with further details in a few moments. The shore emergency party carries out the procedures in accordance with the shore contingency plan. In this exercise, good planning and a well-drilled team, coupled with the identification of the risk, enabled everyone to take prompt action. Check the valve again and the blank cap make sure the leak is staunched. Fortunately, the containment of the leak was a simple task. If water is used, this itself should be the subject of double checking and seeking of guidance from the EMS schedules. There are three main reasons for this. First, large quantities of water may affect the ship's stability due to the free surface effect. Second, the use of water may result in unwanted spreading of a spilt corrosive substance. And third, the affected substances in the vicinity may react adversely with water, leading to further incidents. All that remains to be done is the decontamination of clothing and equipment, followed by their correct maintenance, recharging where necessary, and storage in readiness for use again. Despite following all the provisions in the transport of gases, the hazards which they represent on board ship include the consequences of possible leakage. Some gases are heavier than air, and may find their way into accommodation areas via hatchways or through open doors. Unusual smells should always be investigated to reduce the risk of poisoning or explosion. A ship carrying dangerous goods 
should have sufficient gas detection equipment to detect any leakage from the most frequently carried cargoes. Here, a multigas detector is used. When gas cylinders are involved, besides knowing the hazards of the gases carried, special precautions must be taken in case the cylinders leak or are involved in a fire. In the case of fire, it may be better to allow them to burn out, whilst maintaining cooling throughout the process, rather than trying to extinguish the flames and allowing the leaking gas to become a hazard. This, of course, depends on circumstances. Burns caused by fire, or from being in contact with chemicals, must be treated immediately. The section in the supplement to the code Medical First Aid Guide for Use in Accidents Involving Dangerous Goods provides a flow diagram of symptoms which leads to the recommended emergency action in case of exposure to dangerous goods. Both the recommended emergency actions and the first aid guide should be studied by seafarers and where possible practice drills should be held regularly. With all dangerous goods, pollution at sea must be considered, especially if an incident takes place near land. The shore authorities must be notified if any chemicals are lost overboard or are jettisoned for reasons of safety, in accordance with the recording procedures detailed in the supplement. Properly declared cargoes, correctly packaged, stowed, segregated and secured, are likely to be carried by ship without any problems. But do not be complacent. Do not assume that things can't go wrong. Be aware of the properties of the cargoes carried. Have a plan of action ready for emergencies. Be familiar with the emergency response equipment available and ensure that everyone knows their duties in the event of an incident. That way, in the interests of yourself, your fellow seafarers, and your ship, you'll be constantly prepared and so much safer by simply expecting the unexpected.